Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4. The Lord has two great loves in this world, the nation of Israel and the church. Those are the two great loves of the Lord. I'd like for you to go back in your mind with me, imagine if you will, or at least try to picture it, being in modern day Rome. I've been there on a few occasions and I have seen Rome and I've been amazed at the friendliness of the Italian people, their excellent food, the beautiful sights to see, the relics, everything that bespeaks normally to our minds about the glory of Rome. But the best way to understand is to go to the place outside of modern Rome and a bit inside Rome where there are ruins that are being kept to attract tourists from around the world, to see the magnificence through those ruins of the old Roman Empire that was the mightiest empire the world has ever seen. Those ruins bespeak of an absolutely beyond description empire in its power in its glory. One very simple thing with which you can identify is the Colosseum, that huge arena that looks very much like a modern football stadium. It's huge. It's massive. Even the ruins are massive. But the ruins are there. You walk a little bit further down the road, past the Colosseum and you'll come to an ancient prison. It's called Mamertine Prison. It was in Mamertine Prison that the Apostle Paul lived the last days of his life. There were two prison cells in Mamertine Prison. One cell was on the main floor. But the cell for prisoners that they did not want to escape was below the floor. Nowadays, for tourists, there's a staircase down into that prison so that you can pass down to that dark, dark prison, which now for tourists is illuminated with lights. But in the days of Paul, when he was held there, they probably, if they treated him like other prisoners that had been held in that Mamertine lower prison, they tied a rope about him and lowered him through a hole in the floor down into Mamertine prison. What made it inescapable inescapable was that it was literally, literally a hole, not a big one. Maybe, maybe seven feet high to the ceiling. Maybe 12 feet across in diameter. Maybe, not very big. And it was cut out of solid rock. There is no way for a prisoner to break through to the outside, nor could he get out because he couldn't get up to get through that hole. There was a hole in the floor through which he had been lowered into that cell. That's where Paul was. There was also a hole in the side of the wall that led out to another arena, a smaller arena than Colosseum. That arena was called the Circus Maximus. Hear me now. 
We know of no Christians being killed in the Colosseum. Now, Hollywood has made us believe they were, but we have no evidence of that. It was at the Circus Maximus that Christians were fed the lions. It was at the Circus Maximus where they were beheaded. And we think by legend and by some historical accounts that that indeed is what happened to Paul. Now, why did Paul suffer execution, martyrdom, if you please? What was the reason the Romans had? It's very simple. I've been to the building. There's a huge building near Mamertine Prison. It's an ancient building. It's roundish. And if you look up on the sides of the wall all around, you will see a shelf-like construction. And on that shelf are literally hundreds of symbols of ancient gods. And what the Romans would do when they conquered a land, they would take the symbols of deity, the symbols of their god, and bring it and put it in this huge building. More or less a temple of sorts. So what the Romans thought in their minds, we now have discouraged their people. Their God is gone. Their God has let them down. They have no hope. But if there is any power to their God, we're going to claim that power along with all these other gods on these shelves. The reason that Paul had to die was not that he said Jesus is God. That's a mistake. If he had said Jesus is God, just like all these other gods, they would have let him live. But he didn't do that. He said Jesus is God and he's the only God. Well, if that were true, and people believe that, then that means all these hundreds of other symbols of gods they have in that building over there are nothing but pieces of art. They have no power, and we can't stand for that. So Paul died because he maintained that Jesus is the only God. Now, why have I said all that? Those were the last days of Paul. Most Bible commentators will tell you that 2 Timothy was written in Mamertine prison. It was the last words of Paul. I don't have time to read the book. There are four chapters to the book of 2 Timothy. Sometime this week, perhaps you ought to take it down and read it. And just remember, it's Paul's last words. But I would like to read a few verses from 2 Timothy chapter 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come. I'm going to change this. Not for the time will come, for the time has come. When men will not endure sound doctrine. It's already here. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Do you hear that? But watch thou in all things, in your afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. That's me. I'm doing it. Make full proof of thy ministry. 
for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. There it is. Paul knew that he was about to die. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but to unto them also that love his appearing. Now think about this for a minute. While Paul was in Mamertine prison, where were all the other Christians? Where were they? The other Christians in Rome were down the road, basically at a graveyard. I've been there, called the catacombs, underground. Catacombs. I've been in there and I've walked through the catacombs and you can see the caskets with the mummified remains, many of them, of ancient Christians who lived there and worshipped there because Roman soldiers had a fear of going into the catacombs, pursuing people. So as long as they stayed there, they were safe from government intrusion. But Paul said, there's a day coming. People are going to want to hear something other than the truth. I'll tell you when that day came. A little over 300 years later, when Constantine became emperor of Rome, he became a Christian. And at that point in time, Christianity literally became the state religion. Now these that had been hiding out in the tombs called the catacombs, fearful for their lives, despised by society, now were being honored and applauded. They could walk down the streets of Rome, down those broad avenues. They could shop in the marketplaces. They could attend public meetings because now they were honored as the religion of Rome. Instead of gaining power, they lost power. Did they gain influence? Of course they did. But often, when people gain influence as, as believers, they begin to get the applause of the wrong crowd. The real Christian is only interested in applause from one person. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is counter to this world. Be very, very careful when the world begins to applaud you. Because often it means you're about to take a downward swoop. Those Romans were powerful. They were powerful. That great Roman army. I wish you could go with me. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if you've never been to Israel, at least look it up on the internet. Please look it up. You need to look this up. There is in Israel a place called Masada. Let me spell it for you. M-A-S-A-D-A. -A -A. Let me spell it again. M-A-S-A-D-A. When the Romans were at their peak of power, King Herod, that hated king, built for himself a fortress 600 feet above the valley floor, not far from Jericho. It resembles that, that huge rock upon which he, which he built it. It, it resembles some sort of a huge desert stone dune of sorts, towering 600 feet. He built it up there because there was only one possible way to get there from the valley floor. And if the Romans came and 
He was threatened at Jerusalem. He could flee to this place called Masada. There is till this day that one way to get up there, to get that 600 feet to the top. And it's called the snake trail. It's called that because it winds back and forth up the one side that slopes enough that a man can walk it. But he would have to go single file. You couldn't even have two men on that snake path to the top. So what Herod and his men thought, even if the Romans try to come up, they'll only be able to come up one at a time. We'll kill them from the top. You can go there today, but they have a cable car that will carry you by cable car strung out above that valley floor and above the wall of Masada to the top. When you get to Masada, there are lavish baths and places of luxury for King Herod that he could enjoy it. When the Romans finally did come to destroy Jerusalem, a few over 900 did make it to Masada. And they got to the top and felt they were safe. The Romans on the valley floor didn't know what they were going to do. They finally came up with a plan. And in that desert, obviously, was a lot of rock, and they gathered thousands upon thousands upon thousands of rocks and dirt and built a sloping area, a huge sloping area, not like the one that had the snake path on it, but a huge sloping area. Not so steep, but that they could push engines of warfare and battering arms up to the top to batter the city and thousands of their soldiers. Did it take a long time? Yes, it took months and months and months and months and months. But they had the time. They weren't worried at Masada because it had been created with very, very huge water tanks that could be filled before the enemy came and with huge storage areas for food. So they weren't worried about running out of food or water. But they finally saw that the Romans were going to come up. So rather than giving the Romans the pleasure of killing them, they committed mass suicide. So when the Romans finally got to the top, they were all dead. Some say maybe one or two escaped. Why am I saying all this? I've stood at the top of Masada where Herod had built that lavish getaway. You can look down on that valley floor. Now, you can't see it on the valley floor, but high up there, 600 feet up, you can see all over that valley floor rock fences that the Romans had built almost 2,000 years ago to hold their cattle and their horses and to put up their bivouac tents. It's all there. This huge, mighty Roman army. Now, I want you to think with me a minute. Rome, with all of its glory that I described a while ago, and that vast Roman army that was intent upon destroying Israel, they're all gone. The mightiest of the mighty, but they're gone. From 1948, when the Jews started coming home, we have a thriving nation now. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Jews. Hundreds of thousands. May I tell you that at the end of time, God loves two peoples. He loves the Jewish nation. And he loves the church that is so powerfully, so powerfully described by Paul in his 13 letters in the New Testament. The heartbeat of God 
is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Jewish people. There are two words that I think describe what's going to happen at the end of time. I don't have time to look at it, but I will perhaps at a later date. One is there will be a total restoration of Israel back to God, which will take place during the seven years of tribulation. Part of that restoration has already begun because they've already come back in 1948 to claim the land of Israel. And in 1967 and 68, as they returned home after that war with the Muslim nations. But still, the restoration will not be complete. Because right now, the land of Israel, the total land of Israel, is about the size of the state of New Jersey. But when they're completely restored, they will then have the Bible description of their land, and that will include among other things, what we call Egypt today and Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq. All of those Muslim nations will actually be Israel when there's a restoration. That's one word about the end of time. That's for Israel. For the church, there's another word found in Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. I believe the church during the end time is going to have an outpouring. Israel will have a restoration of all the biblical lands when they come back to God. I believe the church is right now on the edge of having an outpouring of the spirit of the living God. I think it's about to come. I think we're on the verge of it. I can sense it in my soul. It's going to be an outpouring of the spirit of the living God. I find it remarkable that we hear about people being saved, and that's wonderful. We hear about people being saved in many denominations. That's grand. In a few denominations, we hear about people being separated or sanctified. I think that's good. But he talks about his spirit being poured out upon all flesh. Talking about the church. You know, the Bible talks about being filled with the spirit. You don't hear very much about that. But what Joel is talking about is a time when the spiritual filling is going to take place. Now, when we talk about being filled with the spirit, don't think about it as some sort of illustration of a man having a gallon bucket and he fills it with water and he says that's what being filled with the Spirit is. No, 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 no. Being filled with the Spirit is like you at your house. If you have a key to every door and every drawer and everything in your house that has a lock on it, if you have a key and there's not one single drawer, not one single door that is locked that you can't open, then you can say, your authority fills that house because nothing is locked to you. What the believer needs to understand today, the man or the woman that is truly saved, it's not enough to be saved. To have authority and power with God, you need to be filled with the Spirit. What is being filled with the Spirit? There's nothing in your mind that is locked to God. There's nothing in your life that is locked to God. There's nowhere in your relationships that you won't let God freely enter. Nothing in your entertainment world. Nothing anywhere. Everything is open to God. Is everything in your life open to God? Does He have access to every part of your life? Romans 
recently. I've been telling people, and I'm telling you, to save, to be saved, means the hell problem has been solved. Peter said five times in the book of Acts that he was filled with the Spirit. What does filled with the Spirit mean? Being filled with the Spirit happens automatically when you confess every known unconfessed sin or attitude in your life. Is there an attitude you shouldn't have? Have you confessed it? You can't be filled with the Spirit until you do. Save, yes, you're saved. Nobody's questioning that. But I believe there's going to come a time. We're going to see something remarkable take place. When people who are saved begin to confess their sins. Many years ago, at a Methodist school by the name of Ashley, there was a great spiritual awakening. During chapel one day, just an ordinary humdrum service with a preacher and some singing at Ashley. A young man got up and in front of the student body and faculty, he began to openly begin to confess sins that he had committed that stood between him and God. People at first were astonished. Can't believe he's doing it. And then another boy, another young lady, a faculty member. The chapel service time was completed, but this went on and on. After school, people were gathering in the chapel, confessing their sins. It ended up 24 hours a day, week after week. People began to hear about it. Coming from far and near to confess their sins. Because when sins are gone, the Spirit has total access in your life. Let me say this to you. When you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes in and He's resident. But that's not good enough. He needs to be president. The Holy Spirit may reside in your life, but is He presiding in your life? That, dear brother, dear sister, is the question. Rome thought they could get rid of Israel. Why, we're big, powerful Rome. You're weak, miserable Israel. But God had a plan for Israel. It was restoration. Well, you Christians, Paul, will just kill you. We'll behead you. We'll get rid, eventually, of all those Christians that are hiding out in the graveyards and catacombs. Why, we're big, mighty Rome. But God had a plan for the church, and it was an outpouring. I want to watch the restoration of Israel, but I want to be a part of the outpouring. To the best of my ability, to the best of my ability, I stay prayed up in confession of every known sin so that I can look at myself and say, I'm truly filled with the Spirit, therefore I have the power of God upon me and His authority. I pray that's true with you. God bless you.